Hello, and uh, thank you for joining the Navigating Tax Reform for Manufacturers and Owners. Uh, this webinar is uh, being presented by uh, Clifton Larson Allen. Uh, just a, a housekeeping uh, item. Uh, as you are all aware, everyone is muted. Uh, however, there will be a, a Q&A session at the end. Um, once that happens, uh, I will unmute each person if they have a question. Um, in regards to the questions, if you do need to ask something, there is a question box that's on your uh, menu panel. If you could please type in your questions there. Uh, this will ensure that everyone's questions get answered um, by either um, Eric Ski or by Nick Romanelli, um, which takes me to the intro of our speaker. Um, so Nick Romanelli, is, um, he manages the federal and state tax advisory and compliance for all types of entities and their owners. Um, his grandfather actually started a stainless steel pipe fittings and flanges company in Carroll Stream, Illinois, where he used to work during his summers off from school. Uh, Nick is one of the principals at um, CLA. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and open it up for Nick. Thanks, Kelly, and thank you to the NTMA for the opportunity to speak today. Um, as Kelly mentioned, my grandfather did start a stainless steel pipe fittings and flanges company back in the early 80s. Uh, so family bone businesses, manufacturing is very close to my heart. Uh, my father, my two uncles, my aunt, my cousin still work there. Grandpa has since passed, but he would be proud that I'm able to talk to you guys today. Uh, so I did work there over the summer uh, in between high school and college and running the order picker, running the forklift. So I'm very, very familiar with manufacturing operations, and I'm happy that I could talk to you about the tax reform today. Um, so we'll flip right into it here. So the learning objections for today's session. I want to be able to identify key points related to tax reform in 2018, understand how it impacts you and your business, and to be able to develop specific planning strategies to minimize tax, eliminate risk for your individual situations. So I think this legislation probably had more media coverage and more TV coverage than any other piece of legislation that I've seen, at least in my lifetime. But there was a lot of back and forth between the House bill, between the Senate bill, on exactly what was going to end up being in the final bill, whether or not it was going to even get passed. Um, but it did get passed on December 22nd, 2017. President Trump signed it into law. I like to call this the law formally known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act because Due to some odd parliamentary procedure, they had to change the name from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to that HR1 official title, which I don't even need to read. We'll just call it the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for purposes of this session. Um, and this is also the one where you see, I think there's a, a meme of Paul Ryan, the picture of him with the tax return postcard in the background, hopefully simplifying everything for everyone. Um, but as you'll see as we walk through there, <clears throat> I don't necessarily know that they got to a simplification of the tax code. So at a high level, we'll start with uh, tax rates. And on the individual side, you'll see uh, that the highest marginal rate is now dropped to 37% from 39.6%. So you've got a lower overall rate. You've got some wider brackets. So it takes until $600,000 on a married filing joint return to get into that top bracket. Um, in exchange for some of the reduced rates, there was the elimination or the limitation of some deductions and incentives that people have historically taken, and we will get into some of those limitations as we move through the program today. On the corporate side, you used to have a graduated corporate rate, the max rate of 35%. You also had a 20% corporate AMT rate prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. After the act, you have a flat 21% tax. Uh, the 20% corporate AMT, alternative minimum tax, was repealed. So no more AMT at the corporate level. There was talk about the AMT being eliminated at the individual level. They ended up retaining it, um, but they changed a few of the limitations and the, the way that, uh, that it's computed, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on the individual side. Um, so what does this mean for your businesses, just the overall rate changes? A lot of tax planning strategies at the end of the year were to push deductions into 2017 when we had higher tax rates or defer income into 2018 when we had lower tax rates. Um, the year is over, so a lot of tax planning strategies that, uh, that had to be implemented by year end have kind of sailed. 
but there are some opportunities still to take advantage of pushing deductions into 2017. A few of them, cost segregation study. So taking a, a building that you either placed in service in 2017 or prior that you would normally depreciate over 39 years. Doing an analysis of that building, breaking it out into assets that would be five-year assets, seven-year assets, 15-year assets, and catching up depreciation on those assets as if you had depreciated them under those shorter lives from day one. Uh, you can also take a look at your other depreciation methods on assets that you've got placed in service to see if there's anything else that could be reclassified as a five-year, as a seven-year, as a 15-year asset. Uh, there's an election to treat certain prepaid expenses as deductible in the year paid as opposed to taking the expense ratably over the life of that prepayment. Um, that would allow you to push that deduction into 2017. Uh, and the extent that you have any software development costs that you may have capitalized under certain circumstances that software development can be expensed. And the way that you would catch up all of these deductions and push them into 2017 is via what we call an, an accounting method change. And we'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of an accounting method change a little bit later in the presentation. But for automatic changes, it allows you to claim that benefit up until the extended due date of your tax return. So if you are a flow-through entity, you have until September 15th. If you're a C-Corp, you have until October 15th to get some of these things put into play. On the estate and trust side, they kind of mirror the individual tax rates. Uh, but what I want to point out on this slide is they basically doubled the lifetime estate exemption up to $11.2 million in 2018. Uh, and with some planning and with the portability election, you can actually transfer your spouse's limitation to get an overall limitation of $22.4 million. So in 2018, I would recommend maybe sitting down, looking at your estate plan to see if there's anything else that you may want to do to take advantage of this increased exemption. They also kept the $15,000 annual gift tax exclusion uh, that was retained under the Tax Cuts and Jobs. Capital gains rates really didn't change much. You still have your 0% bracket, 15%, 20%. The actual brackets are pretty close to the same here. Um, so really not much changed uh, in the act on this particular piece. Now on the individual tax deductions, here's kind of where you get into some of the changes and some of the ones that maybe have been a little bit more public. Um, so the standard deduction is basically doubled for all filers. So you've got $12,000 of standard deduction on a single return, $24,000 on a married filing joint, $18,000 on a head of household. Uh, in exchange for that increased standard deduction, personal exemptions have been repealed. So those are the exemptions for yourself, your spouse, and all of your kids. So depending on the number of children that you have and whether you were phased out of that limitation, uh, that personal exemption may offset your increase in your standard deduction. They also changed some of the rules on mortgage interest. So mortgage interest is now limited to the interest on $750,000 of principal. And these are for agreements, debt agreements entered into as of 1-1-2018. They did retain uh, the deduction allowed for your second home. And on the home equity interest, there's a maybe. Home equity interest before the tax act was a yes. Home, e home equity interest expense after is a maybe. You need to really look at that home equity interest to see what the proceeds were used for. To the extent that they were used for acquisition or improvement of your primary or secondary home, then they're deductible subject to the overall $750,000 limitation. The other big change on the itemized deductions were for state and local income taxes. Um, so these are deductions for real estate taxes, personal property taxes, and state and local income tax. Prior to the act, you could deduct all of those. After the act, you are now limited to $10,000 of the aggregate of state and local property and income tax. So this may severely limit your availability to deduct some of those taxes, especially if you're in a higher tax state. And this was uh, part of the reason why, at least in Illinois, there were lines out the window or out the building around the corner to try and prepay 2018 real estate taxes to push that deduction into 2017 when it wasn't limited. <clears throat> Excuse 
me, an interesting story here, and you can see how some of the higher tax states are trying to combat, combat this a little bit. California came out with a bill that would set up something that they call the California Excellence Fund. And this would be a federal charitable organization that you would be able to make contributions to as a California resident. California would then give you a dollar for dollar reduction of your California state income tax for the amount that you donated to this particular charity. So at a federal level, what they've done is they've now changed your state income tax payment, reclassified it as a charitable deduction, which if you see on my slide is limited to 60% of AGI, not the $10,000 that would be around for the state and local income tax piece. So we'll see if that bill actually get passed or if there's any other state schemes that they try and get around some of these limitations. My guess is that, that nothing ends up happening on that California one, but it'll be an interesting follow. Uh, another tax planning thing, uh, tax planning item for years 2018 and beyond might be bunching your charitable contributions into a specific year as opposed to making consistent annual contributions. And what do I mean by that? So if you have a scenario, let's say you're filing a married filing joint return, so your standard deduction you know you're going to get is $24,000. Let's say you have $20,000 of itemized deductions, including mortgage interest and $10,000 of state and local property tax and income tax. So you've got 20,000 of total itemized before your charity, and you plan on giving $4,000 a year for the next four years for a total of $16,000. If you gave that $14,000 equally years one through four, you'll now have $24,000 of itemized deduction, which is the exact same as the standard deduction that you would have been entitled to anyways. So you really got no incremental benefit from making that charitable contribution other than the feel good that you have inside your heart. Uh, if you instead pushed all of those charitable contributions at $16,000 of contributions into year four, what would end up happening is you would be able to claim your standard deduction in years one through three and $36,000 of itemized deductions in year four, the $20,000 of interest and property tax plus the $16,000 of charitable contributions made in the year. So those are some of the things that you'll have to do to, to look at planning around some of those limitations that they now have. Miscellaneous itemized deductions, the, those sub, one subject to your 2% floor, employee business expenses, investment expenses, tax prep fees, those have been repealed. They also reduced retroactively to 2017 the floor on your deduction for medical expenses. So it went back down to 7.5% uh, from 10% that it was prior to the act. The act also got rid of the itemized deduction phase out, which was the, the P's limitation as it was called. Uh, when your AGI was over $313,000, you started to lose some of the benefit of making those, those itemized deduction payments. That has been repealed under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. <clears throat> now we're gonna start getting into uh, what I think is gonna be the most scrutinized, the least understood, the most open for interpretation area of the act, and that is this 20% deduction for qualified business income under Section 199A. Um, under Free Tax and Cuts and Jobs Act, this was just subject to ordinary income. So this is income from sole proprietorships, S-Corps, LLCs, partnerships, all of that was taxed at ordinary income rates prior to the implementation of this deduction. This deduction is a 20% deduction of the qualified income from those entities, and it basically puts a top tax rate of 29.6% on income earned from those entities. Now, it's gonna, the complexity is gonna come into play when you think about which entities are eligible. Specified service businesses, including accounting, uh, lawyers, medical service providers, those have been exempt. They're not eligible for the Section 199A deduction, uh, the 20% deduction here. Uh, in very limited circumstances, they can be eligible if your AGI is under a certain point, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the other complication can come on the limitations that they put in place to try and limit some of the gamesmanship that you have with this deduction, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. At a state level, this is a deduction. It's not a deduction in not a deduction in arriving at AGI. So your AGI will be unchanged with this deduction. It will impact your taxable income, so it's a below the line deduction. So for most states, they use AGI, adjusted gross income, as their starting point 
for determining what you owe it as a tax liability. There are some states that use taxable income as their starting point. And since this deduction will change taxable income, those states will need to figure out exactly how they want to conform or not conform with this deduction. As I mentioned, this is a 20% deduction of non-wage trader business income from sole proprietorships, pass-through entities, S-Corps, LLCs, partnerships, and the wages that you receive from the S-Corp or guaranteed payments that you receive from the partnership is not included in the definition of this 20% deduction. This deduction is also limited to 50% of the taxpayer's allocable share of W-2 wages from that pass-through entity, or 25% of allocable W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of qualified property, limited to the greater of those two. Now, the funny story, and again here, it depends on how much you follow the, the politics behind this. There was a senator in Tennessee who was very opposed to this tax act uh, all the way up until the very, very last day. Uh, this was Bob Corker in Tennessee, and he decided on the last day that he was going to vote for the act. And the reason that he changed his tune is because they added this second layer of limitation. Mr. Corker owns a lot of real estate, rental real estate, which when you think about rental real estate, you don't pay a lot of W-2 wages. You're typically paying management fees or you're handling it all yourself. So under that premise, he would not have been able to take this 20% deduction on the income that he's generating on his rental property. When they added this second limitation, all of a sudden he decided this was a great idea, let's vote for the bill. So what does qualified property mean? Qualified property is depreciable, tangible property held and available for use at the end of the taxable year. And you include that property if you held it at least 10 years or until the expiration of your recovery period. So you basically get 10 years to include machinery, equipment, furniture, and you get 39 years or 27 and a half years, whether it's non-residential or residential real property to include those that real property in your limitation. So this I think is where some of the gamesmanship is going to come into play because um, when you think about certain entities and, and what your incentive is as a pass-through owner now, um, if you think about your wages being taxed at ordinary income and your flow-through income potentially getting taxed at, at a lesser amount by including this deduction, the incentive would likely be to pay yourself less salary, subject less at ordinary income rates, and let the rest flow through as qualified business income, um, subject to this 20% deduction. So that's part of the reason why the wage limitation was put into there. And on the back end, you also have the idea that you're required to pay reasonable compensation out of your S-Corp or out of your partnership. Um, so if you start to see, or if the IRS gets wind that people start changing their W-2s down to a dollar, uh, to take advantage of this QBI, you might have some issues on the IRS claiming that you're not paying yourself reasonable compensation. Um, there's also some uncertainty here on what happens when you have related businesses. So let's say you have a management company that is a separate taxable entity from an operating company. And the operating company is the one that's generating all the profits. The management company is the one that's paying the W-2 wages and, and let's say it's close to break even. Under that scenario and under a plain reading of the rules, that operating entity is still going to be limited to 50% of W-2 wages. You're not going to be able to elect to aggregate or group those two activities, the management company and the operating entity, for purposes of these limitations. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops and whether or not they do make a grouping election available to account for certain situations like the one I just described. Certain taxpayers who have AGI of under $315,000 on a joint return or $157,500 on a single return won't be subject to the wage limitation or the property limitation. Their limitation will just be 20% of qualified business income. Um, and this is also where the specified service businesses will also be able to take advantage of that 20% deduction if their AGI is under, or tax, sorry, taxable income is under those thresholds. This is also a deduction, the 20% QBI deduction is eligible to reduce your alternative minimum tax income. It is not available to reduce self-employment tax. So if you're a partner in a partnership, 
that's getting guaranteed payments or flow through income subject to SE, this will not impact that SE tax. The deduction is also available to people who claim the standard deduction as opposed to the itemized deduction. Some other individual tax provisions that I wanted to touch on. Uh, child tax credit increased from $1,000 to $2,000. They also increased the AGI limitations at which those credits start phasing out. They retained the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is your education tax credit. That is still around. They're changing the rules on alimony, so effective for divorce and separation agreements after 1231-18, alimony is no longer deductible by the payor and it is no longer includable in income by the recipient. So this will change some of the math uh, when you're looking at those, those alimony payments. The exclusion for moving expense reimbursements paid by employers has been suspended until 2026 for everyone except for members of the armed forces who moved pursuant to a military order. Uh, in addition, the moving expense deduction at the individual level has also been suspended until 2026. The individual mandate for health insurance under the Affordable Care Act has been repealed. So this was the shared responsibility tax that people who did not have insurance got hit with on their tax return. Uh, this was repealed effective 1-1-2019. They'll no longer be required to hold health insurance. The 0.9% Medicare contributions tax, which is a tax on earned income, and a 3.8% net investment income tax, which is a tax on passive and investment income over certain itemized or certain gross income threshold, those are still around. And we'll talk about how that comes into play in terms of your planning for 2018 a little bit later. And as I mentioned earlier, the individual alternative minimum tax was retained. There was talk at the beginning of the process that this was going to be completely eliminated, but they did retain the AMT. However, given the limitation on state and local income taxes, state and local property taxes, and the fact that they increased the exemption most people uh, or less people will uh, be subject to AMT just because of those changes. Moving on to some of the business tax provisions, some of the ones that I think will save a lot of the audience uh, some, some good tax dollars in the next few years. We'll start with bonus depreciation. So bonus depreciation has been around for a while. Um, it was 50% in 2017, and it was only on eligible new property. So basically anything other than a building that you purchased new and placed in service during 2017, you were allowed to take 50% of the cost of that asset as bonus depreciation. And that was scheduled to phase out completely by 2019. Um, under the act, there is now 100% bonus depreciation. So it replaced the 50% bonus. This was another one that was applied retroactively or property acquired and placed in service after September 27, 2017. So you've got some opportunity in 2017 to expense a lot of assets that you placed in service in that fourth quarter. The phase out on this one starts in 2023 and it's fully phased out after 2026. And the big change here was that bonus depreciation is now eligible for used property as well. So there's no longer a requirement for it to be new property. You do have the option to opt out of bonus depreciation by asset class, so by five-year assets, seven-year assets, 15-year assets, um, and also in the first year, so your first year ending after September 27, 2017, you can make an election to just use 50% bonus depreciation as opposed to the 100% bonus depreciation that they changed. It to. They also enhanced Section 179 expensing. So Section 179 allows you to right off in year one, the cost of qualified property. Prior to the act, it was $510,000 was your expensing limitation. And that expensing limitation started to get phased out as you invested over $2,030,000 of qualified assets. It was also very limited in terms of real property that was eligible for 179. So you could only take, <clears throat> excuse me, HVAC units only if they were treated as personal property. Under the new act, Section 179 expensing limitations increased to a million dollars. The investment phase out increased to $2.5 million. And they expanded the eligibility to include roofs, HVAC units, fire alarm and security systems for non-residential real property. So instead of having to write those off over 15 or 39 years, 
you will likely be able to expense those under 179 in the year that you incur the expense. And this is effective for tax years beginning after 12-31-2017. So you might be thinking we've got 100% bonus depreciation now, we've got 100% expensing under 179. What's the difference? Um, some of the differences between them and, and may influence your decision to use one over the other. Section 179 is available to be revoked or implemented on an amended return where bonus depreciation is not. Bonus opt-out must be done on an originally filed return. Um, additionally, some states will follow Section 179 depreciation. For example, Illinois doesn't require you to add back your 179 expense. It does require you to add back bonus depreciation, or at least it did require you to add back to 50% bonus depreciation. All of the states will have to come out and figure out if they are going to conform or decouple from the 100% bonus depreciation. So that question may still be open. Um, on the flip side, Section 179 expensing is limited to business income. So basically you can't use 179 to drive taxable income into a loss with certain exceptions. Bonus depreciation doesn't have that same limitation. You can use bonus, bonus depreciation to increase net operating losses. Bonus depreciation also doesn't have an investment limitation. So if you placed in service $5 million of qualified property for the year, you wouldn't be eligible for 179 you would be eligible for bonus as long as the property was qualified. So those are all considerations that you need to, to take into play when taking into account when deciding whether to use bonus or 179. On the real property side, they retain 39 year life for non-residential depreciable real property. They retain the 27 and a half year recovery period for residential real property. They eliminated the three separate categories of 15 year property, which was qualified leasehold improvement, qualified restaurant property, and qualified retail improvement property. They combine those into one qualified improvement property definition, which was improvements to interior portion of the building, non-residential building, placed in service after the building was placed in service, and it assigned <clears throat> this qualified improvement property, or at least it was supposed to assign qualified improvement property a 15-year regular tax life, a 20-year ADS life. And I said was supposed to assign because this is one of the areas that uh, there was some sloppy drafting in writing a complete overhaul of the tax code in a month. And they rechanged all of the definitions, but they forgot to assign a 15 year life to this category of property. So as of today, reading the law, this category of property would be subject to a 39 year recovery period as opposed to the 15 years that I have on my slide. And this is a big deal because for bonus depreciation and for Section 179, those are only applicable to assets that have a 20-year life or less. So if you end up with a 39-year life on qualified improvement property, you won't be eligible for, for bonus. You won't be eligible for 179. And that's the way that it's written now. I left it in the slide showing the 15-year life because it is expected that there's going to be a technical correction that closes that loophole and assigns a 15-year life to that category. But as of today, that has not happened yet. So that's something that we'll have to keep our eye on as we're going. <clears throat> Another big change is disallowed business interest expense. So under previous law, business interest expense was generally allowed as a deduction. Under new law, this interest expense will be limited to your interest income plus 30% of the remaining adjusted taxable income. Adjusted taxable income is basically earning, earnings before depreciation, amortization, income taxes, net operating losses, and the 20% deduction under 199A. This is determined at the tax filer level, so at the partnership level, at the S-corp level, at the C-corp level, and not at the individual owner level. Uh, if you do end up being limited on the interest expense that you can claim in a certain year, that will carry forward indefinitely to go into your interest expense limitation for future years. On this one, businesses with less than $25 million of an average annual gross receipts are exempt from the calculation. <clears throat> Real property trader businesses are also eligible to elect out of this uh, interest limitation. However, if you opt out of the interest limitation, you end up having to use uh, what we call alternative depreciation system for your real property, which means you are out of bonus depreciation, you're out of 179 for real property. So you'll have to weigh 
whether or not making that election makes sense if you are a real property trade or business. Some of the other things that they changed were on accounting methods. So the cash method of accounting prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was only available to certain taxpayers. C-Corps and partnerships with C-Corps as a partner with gross receipts of under five million, small businesses, gross receipts under a million, certain industries with gross receipts under 10 million, um, and inventory costs were required to be held on your balance sheet and not deducted until they were sold. Under the new law, they have extended that out to permit all businesses with average annual gross receipts of under $25 million to use the cash method of accounting. They've also allowed people with under $25 million in average receipts to hold inventory at cost as opposed to capitalizing overhead um, that you would normally have to capitalize under GAAP and under pre-Act rules. Um, so this is a big change. This is anytime you can use the cash method is going to allow you to defer your tax until you collect your accounts receivable. It gives you a lot more flexibility at the end of the year in terms of managing and, and accounting for taxable income. Um, and, and what the nice thing about this is, is that we talked about accounting method changes before and kind of how you compute those. It allows you to catch up in year one all of the tax that you've paid as an accrual basis taxpayer in 2018. So if you elect to go to the cash method of accounting in 2018, you will get a deduction equal to the spread of AR less AP accrued expenses that will all be able to be deducted in 2018 to basically catch you up to being on the cash basis historically. So this would be a nice benefit to those that qualify. They also allow uh, people, so Unicap, they started a high level Unicap or uniform capitalization was the IRS's way of saying that manufacturers and certain people didn't do a good enough job of capitalizing overhead costs into their inventory. And so it was basically a forced additional capitalization for tax purposes only. And historically, this was applicable to all manufacturers and to resellers who had greater than $10 million of average receipts. This is off the table now if your average gross receipts are under that $25 million threshold. So to the extent that you are a manufacturer or a reseller with less than or with greater than $10 million of average gross receipts, you can now elect to get rid of that unit cap as long as your average gross receipts are under $25 million. So this again should result in deductions available to you by switching accounting methods in 2018 to help reduce your taxable income. In addition for contractors, they changed some of the limitations on who is eligible to use the completed contract method. So at a high level, um, percentage of completion contract is basically you take the cost incurred to date divided by the total estimated cost to complete the project and you recognize revenue equal to that percentage as the project uh, went on. Under a completed contract method, you wouldn't have to recognize that revenue until the job was complete, very inherently in the name, completed contract. So it now expands the definition of who is eligible to use the completed contract method to anyone who has, again, that $25 million of average gross receipts, $25 million or less. This is also an automatic change, so you will, you'll have to file a Form 3115 with the IRS. You send it in, you can do this um, up until the extended due date of your tax return. However, the UNICAP and the cash method, those were done retroactively, meaning you caught up for all of the prior uh, changes as if you were on that accounting method from day one, this particular accounting method is done on a cutoff basis. So for all of your old contracts, you'll still use whatever method you were using prior to this change. For any new contracts, you can start to use the completed contract method as of 1118, as long as you are eligible. A lot of the trade-offs uh, with the 20% deduction with some of these other uh, reduction in rates and eligibility for cash method means that some of the deductions have to come off of the table. We talked about some of the individual ones on the corporate side, the domestic production activity deduction, which was a 9% deduction of the income from qualified activities. That has been repealed starting 1-1-2018. So 2017 is the last year that you'll be able to claim that benefit. In addition, they changed the rules on meals and entertainment. So entertainment expenses, pure entertainment expenses are now 100% non-deductible. 
So that's social clubs, uh, sporting events, golf, all 100% non-deductible now. Um, Employer-provided eating facilities used to be limited to 50%. <clears throat> sorry, used to be limited to, uh, used to be 100% deductible. They've now changed those to be limited to 50%, and they've repealed the employer deduction for employer-provided on-premises meals starting after 2025. So during tax season, a lot of times we would cater in lunch to the office, incentivize people to stick around, maybe get a little bit more work done instead of heading out for a two-hour lunch on a Saturday. After 2025, those deductions go away. Meals that you consume for work travel, meals uh, as part of clients' activities are still allowed at 50%. So what this is probably going to require taxpayers to start doing is to classify some of these expenses up front. So maybe setting up a couple additional trial balance accounts to account for 100% non-deductible entertainment separate from 50% deductible meals separate from some of the other categories that we have here. Um, and I was actually talking with a client earlier today. They were asking the question about golf outings. They do a lot of golf outings, charity outings, um, industry outings. So we're hoping for some clarification on those, but it might be an opportunity to kind of carve out the cost of the actual golf from the cost of any potential charitable contribution or any contribution for promotion or advertisement. I think the IRS is going to come out with some clarifications on certain examples and specific situations that will allow us to, to get a little bit more clarity on what they mean by entertainment expense. But for now, that's what we're left with. Big changes to net operating losses as well. So pre-tax change, there was a two-year carryback allowed and a 20-year carry-forward allowed for net operating losses. You could also offset 90% of your alternative minimum tax with your, with your net operating losses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Under the new act, the carryback is now repealed, so you're no longer allowed to go back and claim refunds for taxable income in prior years. You are also, for NOLs generated after 2017, you can only offset 20 or offset 80 percent of your taxable income in future years. So even if you have, let's say, you, in 2018 you generate a loss of $100, and in 2019 you have income of $100, you're still going to end up having to pay tax in 2019 because that $100 net operating loss limitation is going to be limited to $80. So you're going to have $20 of taxable income left over in 2019. So this is part of the reason why we really emphasize looking at some of those accounting method changes that you could still take for 2017. The cost seg, the prepaid expenses, <clears throat> to the extent that you can drive up your 2017 net operating loss those ones are going to be still classified separately from the net operating losses generated after the act. So you're going to have kind of two different buckets of net operating losses. The 2017 and prior net operating losses are going to have a little bit more weight than the 2018 net operating losses. They also retained a few business credits uh, that have been around for a little while. The two that I want to focus on, the research and development credit, that is still around. They extended that indefinitely. Um, a lot of people think about research as scientists and lab coats and goggles in a lab, you know, doing chemistry and things like that. But it actually is much, much more broadly applicable. So it, it applies to any new or improved product, function, quality, process, um, as long as you are using some of the sciences. So as long as you are testing it using physics or uh, chemistry, as long as you are eliminating uncertainty of results, and you're using a process of experimentation, you may be able to qualify for that research and development credit. So if you are doing any of those things, and I would, I would guess that anyone who's doing manufacturing is likely doing some sort of research and development for purposes of this credit, I would suggest reaching out to me, reaching out to your tax advisor, talking them through what you guys do, your operations, to see if you can get any benefit from the credit. The other credit that was extended is the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. Um, this credit is available for people who hire certain categories of employees, that being long-term unemployed, certain qualified veterans, ex-felons, and you get a credit based on a percentage of the wages that you pay to these individuals. So the credit can range from $2,400 all the way up to $9,600 for qualified employees. This can be a very lucrative credit to people who are hiring individuals in those categories. So I would recommend 
checking with your HR department, checking with who is doing hiring to make, make sure that you're screening new hires for the opportunity to claim this tax credit. They also added a new credit for employer paid family and medical leave. Uh, it's a 12 and a half percent credit paid to qualifying for wages paid to qualifying employees during uh, any period that they're on family, family and medical leave. Um, this is available as long as it's not mandated by your state or local law that you provide this medical leave. Uh, it does require a written policy uh, allowing this in here, and it's only available for 2018 and 2019. The good thing on this one is it's also allowed against AMT. They made some changes on research expenses. Historically, you've been able to deduct those expenses in the year that they were incurred. You are now required to capitalize and amortize those costs over five years starting after 2021. Um, so there is another category, it's a 15-year amortization period if you're doing any foreign research, but you'll have to adjust the way that you're treating some of these r and &E expenses starting in 2022. So as we walk through all these tax provisions and with the reduced corporate tax rate, a lot of people came up to me, a lot of my friends, a lot of colleagues that they were wondering, does it make sense to convert to C corporation? Or if I'm setting up a new entity, should I set it up as a C corporation? Should I set it up as an LLC? Should I set it up as an S corp? And unfortunately, I don't have an exact answer for everyone. It's really a fact and circumstances for each individual scenario to determine which one's gonna be better for you. Some of the things that you should think about though, if you're a pass-through, are you going to be eligible for that 20% 20, 20 pass-through deduction? Are you a service business? Are you a manufacturer? If you set up as a C corp, What's the timing of your dividends? What are you gonna do with the cash? If you're distributing that cash out as a taxable dividend, you are triggering double taxation in that year, which makes C Corp format a little bit less, uh, less friendly. How much state tax are you paying? State taxes are still deductible to C Corps. They are very limited or eliminated at the personal level. So if you have an S Corp or an LLC that's doing business in a lot of states, those deductions are gonna be incurred at the individual level. And as we talked about earlier, they're gonna be limited to $10,000, the aggregate of state and local taxes. Do you have passive owners or active owners? We talked about the 3.8% net investment income tax still being around. So if you have a passive owner of an LLC, an S Corp, they're likely subject to that 3.8% net investment income tax. Also, what's your exit strategy? How long are you going to continue to run the business? When you exit, are you looking at a stock sale? Are you looking at an asset sale? Um, are you available to potentially exclude some of your gain on C-Corp stock sales under some nice incentives that the, tax, that the IRS has? Um, and then international issues. How are you structured if you have inter international operations? How are you structured? Do you have controlled foreign corporations where you have deferral? Do you have check the box where you're treating those as flow throughs and picking up the foreign income or expenses as incurred? So all of these need to be considered when you're thinking about your choice of entity. And there's also some potential implications of converting. So you're not starting a new entity if you want to convert your entity. So all these scenarios have to be specifically modeled out. So I would reach out to your advisor, reach out to someone at CLA, talk about your specific scenario, and we can set up an analysis that really walks you through all of your options, looks at your cash flow under all of these options, and makes sure that you're making a sound decision not just based off of the new 21% tax rate or some of the other, other new tax reform items that we have, but that you're looking at this as a whole. <clears throat> I'm gonna briefly talk about some international changes as well. Um, the US and the Philippines, I think, were the last two countries in the world that, that historically had a worldwide taxing system. Everyone else taxed you on a territorial basis. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act somewhat gets to that on the U.S. side now as well. Uh, and they get to that point via this 100% dividend received deduction from foreign controlled foreign corps. So historically, if you had a controlled foreign corp, your U.S. tax was deferred until you brought the cash back to the U.S. Under the new act, what they're saying is that you can earn the cash wherever you're set up you can bring the cash back as a dividend in the U.S., get a deduction for that dividend, so basically you're not paying U.S. tax on that piece. You also don't get a foreign tax credit, 
uh, or a deduction for your foreign tax credit as well, but it allows you to repatriate that cash to the U.S. tax-free. Now, I say tax-free, and I have quotes. If you were in my office, the air quotes, you can see that. Um, but there, there are some kind of safeguards that adds a few minimum taxes on, uh, on foreign source income that may have low or no taxes uh, already paid on it. So we'll have to watch how the IRS, how the Department of Treasury interpret some of the rules that they have in there. And you may end up being subject to a, a lower tax, 10 to 13 percent, but not necessarily complete 100 percent dividend received deduction. So we'll have to see how that goes. The other big thing that's been in the news is with some of these international entities like Apple, um, Google, uh, they are now having to pay this deemed repatriation tax on all of the income that they have earned overseas and have yet to bring back to the U.S. I think I saw Apple was, was going to end up paying about $38 billion in this repatriation tax. And so what it is, the 15.5% tax on cash and cash equivalents that you have overseas, and it's an 8% tax on other assets that you have overseas. You can make an election to spread that tax over eight years. And this is what applies to your 10% foreign controlled corps. If you are an S corp that owns a controlled foreign corp, you can elect to continue to use kind of the historical deferral system for that controlled foreign corp until you have what the IRS calls a triggering event. So that would be a sale of the S-Corp stock, a sale of substantially all of the S-Corp assets. If you had that triggering event, you end up being subject to the repatriation tax uh, and are still eligible to spread that tax over eight years. I know we talked about a lot today. We covered individual rates, we covered business rates, we covered a little bit of international here. Um, but in summary, 2017, there are still, there's still time to pull deductions into 2017 to take advantage of the higher rates. Cost segregation study, that one I think is a no-brainer. If you have a building that you placed in service in 2017 or you placed in service prior to 2017 that you still have sitting on your depreciation schedule as $5 million building being depreciated over 39 years, talk to someone about a cost segregation study. You'd be able to pull out some of those assets into 5, 7, 15 years catch up the depreciation on those assets as if you had historically depreciated them on the correct method, pull some of those deductions into 2017. We talked about some of the other um, automatic changes, prepaid expenses, the, the writing off of certain software development costs. Still look at that for 2017. Try and pull as much deduction as you still have time to pull into 2017. We talked specifically on modeling for your entity structure. Get with your advisor, sit down and talk about your facts and circumstances. Look at whether it makes sense to convert to a C-Corp, whether it makes sense to stay in LLC, to convert to an LLC. Take a look at that. Use the factors that I brought up on the slide a couple slides ago to really dive into that model and see what tax reform means to you for the next five, 10 years. Even for 2018, look at your accounting methods. Look to see if you're eligible for a conversion to cash a conversion to write off your UNICAP, um, a conversion to your completed contract methods. You may be able to take advantage of some LIFO methods. Review your capital expenditures in 2018. Decide between bonus depreciation between 179. Uh, and then the last two are, are a little bit more international based, but do an, an E&P study, do a transfer pricing study if you have international operations to understand what that deemed repatriation tax may mean to you. And then the last bullet point I have on here, just talk about it for a quick second. If you're manufacturing products in the U.S. and you are exporting those, those products, there is the opportunity for you to set up what's called an IC disc, which basically converts ordinary deduction into capital gain. Now, this is uh, basically rate arbitrage, so you're just playing off of the spread between ordinary income and your capital gain rate. There is still a spread between those two numbers. They just come down a little bit. Um, but I would say if you do have export sales, get with your advisor, give me a call, talk to see if an IC disk makes sense to, to set up for you. And one other thing, we've got um, 2018 Q1 estimates coming up due April 15th of 2018. You historically may have used safe harbors, which would have been based on 110% of the prior year tax. Now that we've got a massive overhaul in tax rates, in deductions, complete tax reform, 
I would recommend maybe looking to see if you want to do those based on actual results, taking into account some of the deductions, some of the incentives that you may be eligible for, taking into account the reduced rates as opposed to just relying on the prior year safe harbor that you may have done historically. So that is all I have on tax reform. We could have talked for probably another three or four hours and really got into the, the nitty gritty details, but I figured that um, you know, at least for the next 10 minutes or as long as you guys wanted to chat, I'd like to open it up for questions that anyone may have. Nick, maybe while we're waiting for a few questions, yeah. uh, just a, a couple of things. Um, you know, when the when the Tax Act came out, there was a lot of discussion about who receives benefits and and uh, and how mostly people that were either business owners or people with significant incomes were getting the majority of this benefit. Can you just talk briefly? Because I think if you have a person making fifty thousand dollars on the shop floor, a machinist, a, a fabricator, et cetera. Yep they're actually going to get a fairly significant benefit out of this as a percentage of the taxes they're paying, correct? Yeah, they, they should get a benefit as well. Let me flip back to the, the actual rate schedule here uh, on the individual side. Um, but, you know, they, they're also likely going to get a benefit of the increased standard deduction. They may get a benefit of an increased child tax credit. And you can kind of see here, if you look at your $50,000 scenario, let's just say it's a married filing joint return, you were in a 15% tax bracket before, you'll be in a 12% tax bracket after. So there still are some incentives for some of the lower uh, lower earners, not necessarily business owners who are making millions of dollars. Not saying there's not incentives for them as well, but I think across the board, there will likely be tax savings. Um, yeah, so tax savings for okay. And then another question, you mentioned the IC disc, and, and I know that we think of international and we think of exports and we think of big companies, but yep. we have a lot of clients that are either directly or indirectly having products go overseas or go to Canada or Mexico or yep. or, or what have you. So, so can you talk a little bit about the, clearly if I'm shipping something to a, a foreign address, it, it would be worthy of consideration yep. for the IC disc. But how about the indirect? types of shipments. Yeah, so basically as long as the product, a couple of hurdles you got to get through there, as long as you have 50% domestic content on the product that you're selling, and as long as it leaves the country indefinitely, so it can't go out of the country and then come back, I think looking at an IC disc is probably worth it. Okay. Uh, we typically like to see 750 to a million dollars of export sales, qualified export sales. And Eric, as you pointed out, Canada and Mexico are foreign. I've had a few conversations with clients. I ask them, do they export? They say no, and they send me their sales run, and I see Canada and Mexico on there. Those are foreign countries that would qualify if you send stuff up to Canada or down to Mexico. Um, you know, the, the benefit calculation is pretty easy to run once you know what your profit is on those, those sales and whether you qualify. And so it basically is you've got rate arbitrage on the spread between your ordinary income rate, which could be 37%, versus your long-term capital gain rate, which is 20%. So they're even, even with the lower rates, there's still some rate arbitrage that, to be had. Perfect. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff, the, the way that the law was written, it was written very general. So if you, if you read some stuff online, um, there aren't a lot of clarity around certain things. Uh, that 199 deduction, I think, is going to, 199A deduction, is going to be, be a big thing where they need to come out with clarity on who qualifies uh, what happens when you have the related entities, when you have tiered structures, that stuff <clears throat> needs to get clarified. Um, some stuff on the depreciation, as I talked about, there was a, a few drafting errors in there that um, didn't quite end up with the actual intent, the actual benefit that they, they started with. And I think, you know, as this process moves along, the IRS will come out with technical corrections. The Department of Treasury would come out with their regulations that interprets the way that the law was written and we'll have a little bit more clarity and can do a little bit more precise planning once we know actually what the definitions of some of these undefined terms are going to be. Yeah, the other one on that 199A deduction is you need to have active, uh, you need to have income from a trade or business. Does a, does a rental property rise to the level of a trade or business? I don't know. How many hours do you have to spend on that to get it to an active trade or business? That hasn't been defined yet. I'm not sure if they're going to reference the, the 500 hours that you would have for material participation 
whether they're going to set up their own rules for whether you have trader business income just for Section 199A. We'll see how they interpret that one as well. I don't see any questions coming through on line. Kelly, do you have any questions on your end that came through that I may be missing? Um, nope, I'm not seeing any. Okay. There was a question that just came in about uh, whether or not we'd be willing to uh, email out the slides, and we will certainly make the slides available to uh, to all attendees today of this webinar. Yep. And if you do have questions that, that pop up, feel free. My contact information is on the last slide there. Feel free to give me a call, uh, shoot me an email. Um, I'm sorry, Nick, um, there was one from Barton. Uh, yeah, he wanted I, to know for the yeah. senator in Tennessee, what was, okay. Yeah, so the question was for the senator in Tennessee, what was the significance about owning property um, and about that property limitation that we talked about? So the significance is when the legislation started, let me flip to the slide that, um, that I think has the, the detail on here. When the legislation started, the second bullet point wasn't in play. So the way that the legislation originally was written was that your 20% deduction was limited to 50% of the taxpayer's share of allocable wages from pass-through entities. So if you have a rental real estate property, you're likely not paying any wages. So if you don't pay any wages, 50% of zero is zero, you wouldn't be eligible for this 20% deduction under 199A. They added this second bullet point as, in my mind, specifically to the rental real estate market, they added a second limitation that's 25% of allocable W-2 wages plus 2.5% of basically the cost of any qualified property. So if you have a building that you're renting, you'll now be able to pull in 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of that building into your 20% limitation for QBI. So you'll not, you basically it's, it's pulled in rental real estate income into this QBI definition and isn't limiting it to just 50% of W-2 wages. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think so that, was a, that was a relatively humorous thing. It, it, he was very, very stern about being opposed to this legislation, this whole overhaul, and then all of a sudden, the next day, he's all for it, he voted for it, let's get this thing passed. And it, in my mind, it was because they added that second bullet point onto the limitation. So it's pretty much uh, that you can add the value, or 2.5% of the value of the property you have to the deduction. Correct. It, it increases your limitation. So you look at 2.5%, not the value, 2.5% of the cost of the property in terms of what you're limited to. So now you, you can pull that in. So if you don't have any wages, you can still rely on that second bullet point to be able to increase your limitation to claim that 20% deduction. I'm not seeing any other questions. Okay. Well, again, uh, if questions do come up, if you want to talk about uh, any of this in a little bit more detail, free, feel free to shoot me an email, give me a call. I'd be happy to, to walk through some of these, these calculations, some of these ideas in a little bit more detail specific to your situation. Well, thank you very much um, for your time, Nick. And um, as he mentioned, this presentation uh, will be going out to um, all attendees and anyone else who had registered who may not have been able to, um, to jump on. So again, thank you very much for your time. And Nick uh, and Eric from CLA, thank you for the, the time as well. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck, everybody. Thanks. Bye.